In this video, I'm going to talk to you about some of the major differences and terminology that is used in a musical theater production that's different from a straight play or a, a film or television, stuff like that. So if you're new to musical theater or you have to do a musical theater show, this video will help you out with some of the differences. Hey there, hey there, hey. There, I am Doug Fall. This is Augmented Actor, where we help you augment your acting career with tips, tactics, and tech. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm a musical theater person. I, I was trained in, in musical theater in college. I did musicals in high school. I love musical theater. I do sing, I do dance, I do act. I also love to do traditional straight plays. I love to do film and television and all those other things like that. But uh, this video is not about that. It's about helping you if you don't have never done a musical before or if you're new to musical theater, it's gonna, I'm gonna explain some of the musical theater terms that that are commonly used in theater, what they mean, and I'm gonna explain a little bit about some of the differences in musical theater. So musical theater is basically acting with song. So you're acting with singing and acting with dance. If you are a triple threat, you've sure, sure you've heard that term before, a triple th threat in theater is somebody who sings, dances, and acts. And if you can do all the three of those in a competent manner, then you are considered a threat to the other actors out there that can only do one or two or, or, or of those disciplines. A vamp is a is when uh, you're, the actor is about ready to break into a song. It could happen at the beginning of a song or the middle of a song, and they're delivering some dialogue, maybe cracking a joke or something like that. And there's a little bit of timing. There, you need a little bit of time uh, in in the music to can repeat on itself so that the actor can deliver those lines. So a vamp is usually you'll hear and the orchestra will just repeat, repeat, repeat until the actor says the cue line. Everybody knows that on the next phrase, the next bar of that music, they will all pick up and go on with the song. Sits probe or a vandal probe. A sits probe is when you sit down with the orchestra for the first time. In uh, rehearsals, you have a pianist, the, usually the music director, who's playing the piano, and so all of the orchestrations and everything that you get as a singer or a dancer from that music comes from the piano, and you get very used to hearing just that piano part. Well, when you get the full orchestra, suddenly you're hearing sounds out of nowhere that you never heard before, orchestrations, uh, and the lead line of the piano is taken by a different instrument. You need a rehearsal during the process where the conductor, the orchestra, and the actors can all get in the same room and hash out all the little cues and so the actors can hear what they sound like, so the orchestra can hear what the actors sound like, so that you can all agree on when you come in and, and how you're gonna get your note and all that stuff and that's what a sits probe is now the difference between a sits probe and a wandel probe a wandel probe is that a sits probe is where you sit down and each actor comes up uh, a stand sings their song in place whereas a wandel probe you uh, act out the movements and the uh, the blocking and the staging or the dances that you're doing um, in order to uh, do the rehearsal Depending on the show and how far along you are in the rehearsal process, the music conductor will decide whether it to be a sits probe to focus only on the music or a vandal probe to integrate the music into uh, the dance. So if it's a dancey show like West Side Story or something, you're definitely gonna be doing a, a vandal probe. The term park and bark, uh, it's as simple as that, but basically in theater, especially musical theater, you need to belt to the back of the, the back row, you need to project, and so you are mic'd up and all these things to help facilitate that but a park and bark is a number where you park yourself you stand still you're usually in a spotlight uh, there's usually a set change going on behind you something behind the curtain or whatever but you park yourself and you bark your song out so it's usually used in 11th hour numbers and and things like that Incidentally, 11th hour number. Basically this term comes from when shows started at eight or nine o'clock. Usually by the time you hit 11 o'clock, the show is about to wind up, so it's the climactic number that a character sings. Uh, it usually lands in the 11th o'clock hour. So, but the 11th hour number basically means that that dramatic moment song that the character reveals their big 
change and, and, it, and it thrusts the plot to the final conclusion. So the number, everything's coming up roses that uh, Gypsy's mother sings in Gypsy at the end, that's a big 11th hour song. The term spotting is uh, um, something you'll hear about dancers. And spotting is basically where you, uh, you focus on a particular spot when you're turning and you, you, you lock your gaze onto that spot as you're turning and then you flip your head around and capture that spot again. And the reason dancers do that is so that they don't get dizzy when they're turning. And when you're in musical theater, you will have different lights perhaps, a little, sometimes little red lights, sometimes actual spotlights or whatnot, or uh, areas on the stage where you can spot. And so there's a spotter's light for those dancers. And so when they say uh, spot this light, that means you're looking at that direction when you do the turn, or you're looking at this direction when you're doing the turn and you have something to look at. Dance Captain is a person who is not the choreographer of the show, but they are actually in the show and they are sort of an assistant to the choreographer. So during rehearsals, they will often take the dancers into another room and work on things while the director is working on staging for another number. And then it's the dance captain's responsibility throughout the show to uh, monitor the dances and to give the actors notes. They're the only ones that are able to give other actors notes about their dancing. And they often hold little uh, pickup rehearsals to uh, clean up messy spots. And they will sometimes step out of the show and have an understudy go on so that they can watch the show and take notes. There's some differences between traditional stage plays and musical theaters, and these aren't always hard and fast truths. A lot of straight plays will do some of these things as well, but they're, they're more closely tied to musical theater. So let's talk about some of those. Most musical theater is done in larger spaces, and because uh, a person needs to sing over an orchestra, they usually have body mics on. And if they don't have body mics on, then they have floor mics and stuff to pick up. But you're usually mic'd, especially in the larger houses, because it's important to have a balance in the sound and to have the uh, performers voices be heard over the, the loud orchestra. Musical theater actors need to get accustomed to wearing lavalier mics and often they're pinned underneath a wig up here. The wire is drawn through a part in your hair and then you're usually taped on the back of your neck or on the side of your ear. Sometimes they're the little pop singer microphones that come down in front. Different productions will try to hide the microphone, some won't hide them at all, but you'll wear a battery pack, you have to get used to doing that and used to mic tape in and putting those things on, it's an extra cumbersome step. In order for everybody to be on the same page, there needs to be a conductor uh, in a musical theater and that conductor is often the music director, sometimes they are not, but they are often in the orchestra pit down front so everybody can see them. But there's a lot of shows where the pit is covered or the band is on stage back here or off stage or someplace where you can't see them and usually in those circumstances there will be monitors on the balcony or up in the rafters that the actors can see the director. If you've ever been to see a musical and you turn around, you might notice little television sets with a face on them. That's the conductor giving their actors cues. And this is necessary to keep the orchestra and the actors on the same beat, in the same tempo, and you know on the same page, basically. As an actor, you get used to looking at these monitors or down in the pit to know when to come in and uh, what your tempo is. How do actors find their notes? Uh, sometimes you break into a song and the actor just comes in right on the right pitch and uh, and you go, that's amazing, how do they know that? Uh, and oftentimes you are asked to do that as an actor, especially if you're starting a song or even in the middle of a song. Well, one way to get that note is, is a bell tone. And that's basically you hear a little pling just before the actor sings. Now, sometimes that bell tone is hidden in another place or the actor has to carry that tone for 10, 15 seconds sometimes in order to come in. So you have to kind of remember your pitch for a long period of time. It can often come that your bell tone comes from the last note of the preceding song. So you have to hold that note in your, in your mind until you're ready to come in with your song and then go on. Usually you'll hear a bell tone just bling right before the actor starts to sing so they know their note. Now the bell tone is not necessarily the note that they come in on, it is the note that they're landing on. It's the tonic of the music. So, so basically if the note is 
da. The actor might go, I used to be. And so it's the note that they're kind of landing their first major note on. In singers, there are two different voices. There's the legit voice and there is the belter's voice. And also, I guess you could argue that there's the pop uh, voice, which is which is newer pop and there's other different styles too, but the basic two are uh, legit and belt. And legit is very much like opera singers. It's round tones, high palate. The tone is in the soft palate of the voice and it's very proper sounding and beautiful and uh, a nice high vibrato. Whereas belters, they're teethy, their mouth is square, and the tone is in the front of their teeth. It's projected out there. And this is more of a brassy, loud sound, uh, like Ethel Merman is a good example of a belter, and Bernadette Peters is a belter. Knowing the difference between your belt voice and your uh, your legit voice is something that you might be asked to switch back and forth between depending on the role and the music. For dancers and singers, when you're singing music and you have to dance at the same time, there is a, a weird dichotomy because dancers, especially ballet dancers, are taught to hold their core in tight in order to keep their balance. And so ballet dancers are very stiff and this is very tight down here. When you sing, singers are the opposite. You need to breathe from your diaphragm, so your, your belly needs to go out in order for you to get enough breath control. So if you're dancing and singing at the same time, you have to find a balance between when to balance and keep your core tight and when to let your core out in order to get a good breath to, to sing. So there's a delicate balance there that you need to learn if you're gonna be a singer and dancer at the same time. One thing that's important to staging a musical theater number, especially with a lot of people, are the spacing numbers that you will see on the front of a stage. You uh, might not notice them, but if you go see a musical and you look at the very edge of the stage, you'll often see a zero right at center, and then you'll see two, three, four, five, spaced about one to two feet apart, and the numbers get larger as you go to the edge. You might also notice that on a rail behind you in the back of the stage. And the reason for that is that this creates a numbered grid on the stage. So these are the lines that run forward and backwards toward the audience, and then the wings of the house uh, re represent the lines that run sideways across. So you create this grid, and as dancers, whenever the director and choreographer is staging a picture, especially a picture that is um, balanced on both sides of the stage, the performers need to know exactly where to go when they do their moves and when they spread out in and do a kick line or anything like that. You know, and oftentimes they're facing upstage like this and they need to turn around and land right on their number. So that's why you sometimes see the numbers posted on the back wall. This is something that's very new to uh, traditional uh, straight play actors is that, you know, th it's more about the relationship of the person or you go to a, a certain area of the stage where a, a piece of furniture is or something like that. Where it's musical theater, it's often an empty stage and you just need to know how to, you need to know exactly where you're going. So your job as an actor is not only to know the steps and the line and the music and the harmony, but it's to know your numbers for every moment of the song. Uh, and, and that changes. Sometimes you have to learn 20 or 30 different numbers on the grid during a number. <laughs> so it gets a little uh, difficult. And that's what you practice when you're, when you're dancing. Another thing that is very common in musical theater is quick changes. Now this happens a lot in other theater too. Uh, we all have to change costume quickly sometimes from scene to scene, but it happens quite elaborately in musical theater. And often uh, characters, uh, actors are, especially in the ensemble, are asked to change costume sometimes two, three, four times during a number. And those are very quick changes and often very elaborate, colorful, fluffy, or built up costumes. So learning the art of the quick change is an important skill that you will have to contend with. Uh, and you will have dressers 
uh, and uh, those people will help you out. They'll stage an area backstage where you run off, you do things in a certain order, you drop your pants, you take your shirt off while they're putting your shoes on and, and somebody else puts a hat on you and then they button up your back and zip up your thing and then you're out, uh, off to go again. And so that's a very fun, exciting part of acting in a musical. Uh, you will definitely have to do some fun, fast costume changes. And it's like you're on stage even when you're off stage. So those are just a few examples of how musicals are different than regular plays. Uh, if I miss something, please let me know down in the comments below and maybe I'll do another video uh, with some of those terms. I really enjoy doing musicals. I think that uh, everyone should get the chance who's an actor to do a musical at some point or another because you definitely learn some different skills out there that you don't even really think about when you're watching a show uh, that are that you can take back into film work and, and, and stage plays as well. I've done a few, a number of elaborate stage plays like The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which use the numbers uh, and the microphones and things like that. So uh, those elements do creep in into regular uh, straight plays and even into film work, catch, hitting your mark and all those kind of things. Hope you found something useful in this. If you did, hit that like button and hit subscribe as well to see more videos like this. Click on one of the video suggestions on your screen right now and I hope to to see you next time.